Well, good morning. I just said to Marianne, somebody needs to be paying attention to the clock. We are here, we have gathered in the name of Jesus. We are here to celebrate the goodness of our God. It's January 17th, and um, it's good to be gathered as a community of faith. Let me, let me begin here. So the scene is the... Um, they've, they, the disciples and Jesus have wandered um, kind of through the land. They've landed in the, the village of the Samaritan woman, and the disciples have gone into town to get something for lunch, and Jesus has waited by the well. And the woman shows up, and he begins that conversation that, that shows up in John chapter 4, the, the engagement of her and her story and her life. And the revelation of who he is as the, the Messiah, as the one uh, who, who knows her by name uh, and, and just continues to draw her into his embrace. She is um, just delighted with this newfound revelation that she has met the Messiah and runs back to all the people that she's been avoiding to inform them that I just, I found him, I found the one who knows me. And, and, and so the story goes. And his disciples return and they return with, with lunch, and they, um, they come back, and they see him engaged with her, and she runs off and realizes that he, you know, they, they, he's been waiting for them to return. And so while the woman was in town, Jesus' followers were begging him. And this is John chapter 4, verse 31, and I'm reading from the easy-to-read version. Um, it says, Teacher, eat something. But Jesus answered, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So the followers asked themselves, did someone already bring him some food? And Jesus said, my food is to do what the one who sent me wants me to do. My food is to finish the work that he gave me to do. And so we celebrate the goodness of God that he sets the plate for us. Not only of his goodness and his love and his salvation, but he sets the plate for us as we go forth from gathering here into the work that he has for us. Let's celebrate his goodness. God, we are thankful for, for the love of Jesus. We are thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus. We are thankful that we get to be here in this place on this day in your name. Amen.
ahead and sit down. Last week we talked about um, just talking to one person, two person, tell, asking them if there is, um, is there anything I can pray for? Um, I received a call of encouragement this week. Um, you know who you are. Thank you for that. Um, and, and so just, um, are, there, are there stories? I'm going to invite Mary Ann up in a second. You can come up now. I'll invite you up right now. Why don't you come on up right now? <laughs> and, um, but are there, are there experiences, stories you want to share of a person you called and said, can I pray for you? It's okay to talk. Marianne? Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. So it was interesting after Pastor Rick asked or talked about um, thinking about or praying about two people and maybe contacting them, the first person actually came to me, and it wasn't somebody that was put on my heart, so I think the Holy Spirit knew that I needed to talk to that person. And this was somebody that, a friend of mine from Virginia that I haven't talked to real um, recently who texted me out of the blue and said, I'm having a knee replacement and I'd like you to pray for me. So I feel like that was God's way of saying, here's one of your people um, for you to pray for this week. Um, and then the second person is someone who's been on my heart for a while that I've lost touch with. And so I reached out to them and they've been in a really tough spot lately, which I wasn't really sure about. So I was able to pray for them and that, that that felt really special, and I think, again, the Holy Spirit prompted me in that, so. There are those moments where you, you can be in a, in a line at Wesco, you can be, um, you know, moving through uh, in other situations, waiting with other people, um, and you can, and, and you'll, you, fear, you feel that nudge or something. Is there something I can be in prayer for you about? And not everyone is, is open to that, not everyone is friendly to that, and yet that is, um, that's part, certainly it's part of our worldview. It's part of, um, we understand, you know, it's not to, uh, you know, Im impose or Im impress my faith upon another person, but this is how I move through my days. And can I be in prayer for you? It's, it's, um, and, 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 and part of this journey is, is as I was, as Marianne and I were speaking about this, you know, kind of through the week is just, um, it's, it's a normal process. It's just a normal conversation um, to, you know, out of out of kind of out of our realm, and um, and I and a long time ago, I moved from. Um, are there some you know talking with people certainly within the, the the community of the church? Are there things I can be praying for you about? To um, well, we're going to pray right now. We're just going to stop right now, and we're going to pray. And uh, and and people, you you get used to that rhythm, and you get used to that um, those opportunities. And so, um, just continue to to be thinking. And, and open and ears open, heart open to if the spirit puts, or you know what, I, I need to call that person and just say, you know, can I pray for you? Or here's how I have been praying for you. And you can send a text, you can send an email, um, and you can pick up the phone and actually do voice to voice and, and have a conversation with people. So there are things certainly in the bulletin every week that we are to be in prayer for. Um, the, the <coughs> Brian and Monica, um, happy anniversary. 50 years, folks. 50 years. <clears throat> it is a worthy, worthy celebration. And so um, let's be in prayer. Um, let me, I'll, I'll start and you can join in and, and then we'll finish up. So is this a first? No. No? Okay. <laughs> you might think it is. <laughs> I know it's not the first time you've been in front of people. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunities that we have, the intersections, the, the, the times where our lives cross, and we, um, there, there is, is joy in the moment where the Spirit, whether it brings a conversation um, with a person having a surgery that, that says, would you please pray for me, or the discovery of something that, you know what, I want to pray for you right now, and just... Thank you that you move our hearts to be a people who are in conversation with you. And you are the, you are the source of life. You are our resource. You are the, the, the one we have placed our hope in. And we come to you. And we come even now, oh God, as we come 
in the name of Jesus, thinking about so many things that are unfolding and happening from surgeries to the celebration of recoveries to, to people that, that, that we're thankful that those surgeries get to happen, um, that there is a season where the, the, the capacity issues of the hospital have been real and those things have been delayed and we are thankful, oh God, that people can have backs repaired and, and wrists repaired and, and that, that, that doctors can do what you have equipped in, and the gifts and the skills, the training that they have, have undergone, that, that we can use that together in the name of Jesus with the power and the presence of your spirit for healing. God, we pray for wholeness among your people. We pray for hearts that will be yielded and surrendered um, to you, O Christ, that we would know the peace that passes understanding as we move forward into the weeks that are before us. Father, we're thankful. We're thankful for new life. We're thankful for babies. We're thankful for healthy babies and moms that have come through on just uh, delivery and um, just knowing that we come alongside those families and if you charge us to um, be a village to help raise those children. We thank you for that opportunity. Um, Lord, we, we also thank you that we are able to walk alongside those that are dealing with tragedy, dealing with loss, dealing with loneliness, and prompt our hearts and minds to allow us to um, just be nudged to talk to those people, to reach out to them. Even though maybe we can't be face to face, we can still make connection with them. And God, we are mindful that this is a week where, as a nation, there is a um, a transition uh, of the presidential office uh, with President Trump um, exiting and President Biden um, stepping into that. And we pray knowing just the distress and, and the confusion and the chaos, um, the, 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 the hurt and the questions, all of that surrounding this. We pray, oh God, that you will begin to move the heart of this nation in a way that honors you. We pray that you will call us to that place where we find um, our allegiance to Jesus Christ, that where we, we discover the, the wonder and, and, and the awe of who you are as the king of creation and as your ambassadors, oh God. We come before you and we certainly plead the blood and we pray for the presence of your spirit. We pray um, that, that, that you would be celebrated um, privately and publicly as we gather as your people. And Lord, we bind the enemy from affecting us, from affecting our nation, from um, just affecting us as, as a, a community of believers, both in our little local area, but also as a nation, um, that we would, we would fight against division as believers, Lord, that we will come together and that we will be able to manage um, just the emotions that you have given us, Lord. You've given us feelings and that is part of who we are in our human condition and you've created feelings and, and Lord, um, we, we love that, but also sometimes it's hard to, to manage that and to know how to handle our anxiety, our fear, our anger. And I just pray that you will guide and direct us in um, doing that in a way that is honoring to you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for this family, for this community of faith that you have gathered here. You have gathered us that we might be encouraged in your presence but you've also gathered us knowing that you have directions and design and purposes for us as you send us forth mm -hmm. into those, those relationships at work and home and play uh, that we have, that you would be glorified, that you would be the famous one, and that we would continue to walk in obedience mm -hmm. uh, to you and in your name, Jesus, we pray. Listen to you. 
So we are in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. We'll be there for a few weeks. We're, we're just going to be breaking down kind of piece by piece this passage as we walk through it. Let me just jump right in, and it begins like this. Peter writes, The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift. From his great variety of spiritual gifts, use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with the strength and the energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ, all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. God, take this word as we open it and speak to our hearts. Capture our imaginations and our thoughts as we bring them before you as we wait, knowing that in your word you feed us. In your word, you strengthen us, and in your word, you send us forth with your purposes. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So my sister sent me a question last week, and the question is this. Why does the flamingo stand on one leg? And I thought about that, and I thought, I should know this. And then I wondered, well... It, is she serious? Does she really want to know why a flamingo hangs around on one leg? And I thought, no, because if she really wanted to know that, then she could Google that, and, and she'd get a million responses in three seconds, and, and she would know why the flamingo stands on one leg. So this must be a joke. And I thought, well, if it's a joke, then I should know that. And I'm sure that somewhere in those boxes of three by five cards that my dad has filled with jokes, it's in there somewhere, why the flamingo stands on one leg. And so I thought, and I wondered, and then she sent me the response and the answer. Why does the flamingo stand on one leg? Because if it lifted that leg, it would fall over. <laughs> Some of you might get that even a little bit later. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's a good one. But what does that have to do with 1 Peter 4? What it has to do is that sometimes it's right there in front of us. I mean, obviously, if, if the flamingo's standing on one leg and it lifts that leg, it's going to fall over. And sometimes the answer, the action, the response is right there before us. I told you last week that we're going to break this passage down piece by piece, looking at what God is calling us to, what God is asking of us, as we live in the imminency and the, expect, the expectation, the anticipation of Christ's imminent return. So let's look at verse 7 and see what 
um, what Peter has for us, what God has for us through Peter in that verse. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Let's look at how some other translations capture this. From the NIV, the end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. The easy to read version, the time is near when all things will end, so keep your minds clear and control yourselves. This will help you in your prayers. The New American Standard, the end of all things is near, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. The message, everything in the world is about to be wrapped up. So take nothing for granted, stay wide awake in prayer. The contemporary English version, everything will soon be coming to an end, so be serious and be sensible enough to pray. Then the New King James Version. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. There, there are two things that Peter is capturing here in this verse. There are two things that, that he wants to underline for us and that I want to underline for us, which is why we heard that now seven times. The end of the world the end of all things. And the word there, the Greek word is telos, which we sometimes translate goal or translate that the end of all things. And, and actually it comes from the word telescope or, or it becomes the word telescope. And when you think of a telescope as it's extended all the way out, it has reached its telos. It has reached its end. It has reached its goal. And what Peter is saying here that We've reached that place. After the first advent of Christ, we have reached that place where things are going to be wrapped up with the return of Christ. Peter writes to us as, as if it is imminent because in, in the scope of history, in the scope of God's timing, it is. And he writes to us that we are to live within that expectation, within that anticipation, of that. And so that's the first thing he begins to underline. The second thing he underlines is be a people of prayer. Because we live in the time that we live, be earnest, be disciplined, be alert, be sober minded in your prayers. The end of all things is, is near. History as we know it will be wrapped up with the return of Jesus Christ. The question is not if Jesus were to return. The question is when Jesus returns. Peter and the other New Testament believers lived in that anticipation that his return is something they would experience in their lifetimes. And we are called to live with that same type of anticipation and expectancy. Why is this important? Because it leads us to a, a, a second piece in, in understanding that the, the, the times are what they are. And that is, it leads us to an urgency. It leads us to, uh, it, it gives us perspective in this urgency, which informs then the choices we make, the decisions we make, the next steps we take, how we, how we kind of organize our lives moving forward. The anticipation and the expectancy fuels a sense of urgency, giving us perspective, which is why Peter calls us then to be a people who pray. Pray, therefore, because of the days in which you live, pray. Be in the presence of the Father. Paul calls us to the same kind of urgency as he challenges us to love one another, to stop playing around with the deeds of darkness, and instead, because of the time, because of the day it is, clothe yourselves with Jesus. He writes in Romans 13, 11, 
Do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. If we understand anything about timing, we know that we are nearer to the day of Christ's return than Peter was. And he wants us to, to, to sense the urgency and the perspective of that. And the first step, the first step he tells us to take is therefore, be earnest, be alert, pay attention, be awake, be of sober mind, and pray. Peter is telling us the time. The time is, the end is near. And now understanding that, he calls us to pray. And I don't believe that any one of us would argue about the importance of prayer. I don't believe that any one of us would, would set that aside and say, yeah, it doesn't really matter. We understand that it centers us. We understand that it focuses us. We understand that it is both an act of humility and an act of worship, recognizing that I, there are resources and insights and guidance and direction that I need that come through being in the presence of the Father as I yield and surrender myself to his purposes and not my own. It brings my heart and my desires into alignment with God's. We also understand that to be a people gathered to pray is not in conflict with being a people called to action. For prayer is an action where we enlist and we yield ourselves to the very power of the king of creation, the Lord of this universe. And we understand that we have been placed here, placed here, right here on this earth at this time for the purposes of God. Before he was crucified, Jesus spoke with the Father in prayer about us. In John 17, you can read that at some point. And what he didn't do in that prayer where he prayed for us is he didn't ask God to remove us from the world. He did not ask God to take us out, to get us home, to get us out of here. No, he said, protect them. They're here for purpose. They're here on purpose. It's your purpose. Protect them from the evil one. They are not to be of, but they are to be in, and that in is serious and intentional and God-ordained. We are not stuck here. We have been placed here. We have been summoned and we have been sent for the sake of God's kingdom purposes. We are to love one another. We are to care for the widow and the orphan. And we are to go make disciples. We are ambassadors of the kingdom values of Christ and King Jesus. And we are to advance the gospel of Jesus through disciple making. And we understand that this battle is not fought in the political realm. No, Paul made that clear when he wrote to us in Ephesians 6 that our fight is against principalities and powers. We are to confront the very evil that seeks to mislead, to misinform, and distract people from knowing about the forever hope in Jesus. And we pray, we pray that God removes the veil of blindness from the eyes of those who are unable to see and subsequently, that they would not only see, but know the great love of the Father shown to us, both in the manger and the cross. Now, it's important that you understand what I am not saying. I'm not saying that we are not to be involved in the life of our communities. I am not saying that we are not to be salt and light in cultures gone astray. That is a given. We are salt. We are light. 
We are representatives of our Father's kingdom. We are ambassadors. We have been placed here not to sleep our way through tomorrow, but to act on behalf of our King regarding his wishes, his desires, and his commands. And so in this season of urgency, in this time and this day that we live, we are, as Peter instructs and calls us to, we are to pray. And by doing that, we not only remember the rhythm of creation, but we engage it. We engage the rhythm of creation, which we, you understand when you go back and you read the creation poem in Genesis 1. It moves from, and there was evening and there was morning one day. That's not typically how we count our days. We move from morning to evening. We move from work to rest typically in our days. Everybody is working for the weekend. But in the economy and in the kingdom of God, in the rhythm of creation, we begin in the evening because we begin in rest. We begin in the rest of God because it is out of that rest, it is out of that season of engagement in prayer that we understand the design and the purposes and the assignment and the working orders that our God has given to us. And so even in a day where there is urgency, we start in the rest of God in conversation with our Father because it engages his rhythm. And out of being in my presence, you will know and have your next steps. The end of the world is coming soon, therefore be earnest and disciplined in your prayers because it is out of the presence of the Father that we understand the purposes and the reason and that we are here on purpose, the purpose of God. We gather together because we find encouragement in that. We gather together because we find the wisdom of God present because the Spirit of God is with us. We gather together in the Word. We encourage one another with stories of God's faithfulness. We learn how to love one another deeply to be obedient to the command of Jesus Christ. And we do all of this not because we want some kind of gathering around a campfire and we want to hold hands and sing Kumbaya, although that's delightful if you've never done that. Well, it's so much more than that. It is so much more than that. We gather and we huddle and we pray because we are awaiting the incoming play of our king in order to advance the kingdom ball of disciple making down the field. And we know, we know, you're preaching to the choir here, Rick. Our allegiance is to neither a donkey nor an elephant, but to the lamb. And our fuel for this battle does not come from a news source or a social media feed, for either of those leave us looking in the wrong direction and woefully undernourished. No, our food, our food is to do the will of the Father. And to know the will of the Father, we will be present in his word as his word is present in us and we will pray. Our march is on the very gates of hell. In the name and in the power and in the authority of Jesus Christ, that those held in bondage be released to the new life that awaits all who are in Christ. And the timing, the timing of Peter's words to us for such a time as this is the timing of God. 
For we read in Hebrews 4, chapter 12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And so we will pray, knowing that our God will send us down the field to proclaim his goodness to a people so loved by him in a season and time when our days are short. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises and your faithfulness. Thank you for your call and your summons upon our hearts and upon our lives, that we will have active feet and hands, that we will be salt and light, that we will go forward as your people and respond out of the strength and the resources and the gifting of your spirit. Continue to call and grow within us the character of Jesus through the fruit of the Spirit. And continue to move us, not only with compassion, but with passion as well. Understanding the urgency and the perspective of our days, knowing that we have been commissioned as your ambassadors for such a time as this, right here and right now, in the name of Jesus. In you we pray, O Christ. Amen.
capture some of those words from Jesus in that prayer to the Father. I have revealed you, he says, to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that it came from you, and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Father, we are thankful for the words of our Christ, for his prayer on our behalf. And we come, we come as a people gathered to feed off of truth, to feed off of your presence, to feed off of your word. May you bring it to life within our thoughts, our actions, and the lives we lead. From this point forward, may we reflect you, O Christ, as you grow within us, your image, your purposes, and the wonder and awe of your kingdom. So go forth now, O people of God, knowing that it is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit who call you forward, who gift you, who resource you, who send you forth, who guard you by day and protect you by night, going before you on the path you trod. Go in peace and joy, awe and wonder of all that God is doing, now and forevermore, as we find ourselves in this place at this time for the purposes of our God. In the name of Jesus, amen, and God bless you.